Hi everybody, welcome to the next video on unit cells. What we're going to do in this video is accomplish two objectives. I want to be able to quantify unit cells by asking and answering the question, how many atoms are in a unit cell? Seems like a simple enough question. And question two, where do these atoms touch each other within the unit cell? Now, first thing I want to do is just establish a little bit of a, <clears throat> a consistent simplification. These different positions in the unit cells here, these little orange or yellow or blue spheres you see in these top diagrams, I'm going to refer to these positions as being atoms. Now, we could be talking about molecular solids, so that that little orange thing might be talking about a whole molecule. We could be talking about ionic solids, where the little orange circle could be talking about ions. But for now, I'm going to simply refer to them as being atoms. But uh, that doesn't mean that we can only look at atomic solids. There's a whole different you know, set of uh, types of uh, materials we can look at when we look at unit cells. It's just that for simplicity's sake, I'm going to refer to them as being atoms. So, the first question I want to ask and answer is, how many atoms are in each type of these cubic unit cells? Right, we have simple cubic, body-centered cubic, and face-centered cubic. So how many atoms are in, let's say, a simple cubic unit cell? I've got two representations here. I kind of have a ball and stick representation up here at the top, and I have a space filling model down here on the bottom. But they're both referring to the same ideas. So, how many atoms do you see in this simple cubic unit cell? Well, you're going to sit there and count, and you're going to say, Crane, this is an easy question. There are eight atoms. That is actually incorrect. There's actually only one atom in the cubic unit cell. Let's take a closer look at that. So I'm going to draw on top of the space filling model here the front face of the unit cell. And maybe you can begin to see what I'm getting at here. Only a portion of each of the atom is actually inside the cubic unit cell. If I were to color it in, only that portion, for example, of that sphere of that atom is actually inside the cubic unit cell. So it turns out that we don't have all of the atom inside any one unit cell. We have, in the case of corner atoms like these guys here, we only have one-eighth of the actual atom inside the cubic unit cell. So I have one-eighth of each atom. How many atoms do you see there? Well, you see eight. And so it turns out that I have effectively one atom per simple cubic unit cell. All right. Now, next question, and I'm going to clear up a little bit of space here to begin to answer that one. Let me go ahead and clear all that up. Where do the atoms touch in a simple cubic unit cell? Well, you can't really talk about where do things touch by looking up here at the ball and stick diagram because it's an oversimplification. But you can see here in the space filling model that clearly the atoms are touching along the edges. And so if I were to then assume that this edge length here, how long is that edge length in terms of atomic radii? Well, I've got one radius, two radius, so that is two radii long, that edge length. So the edge length is equal to 2r, and the volume, say, of the cube is going to be the edge length cubed, so I could then go ahead and figure out in terms of atomic radii what the volume of this cube would be. So you can begin to see some of the calculations we can do with simple cubic unit cells. All right, let me get rid of that writing, and now I'm going to shift over and take a closer look at body-centered cubic. So my first question, how many atoms are inside a body-centered cubic unit cell? Well, I have my eight corner atoms, each contributing one-eighth of themselves, plus I have to add to that the one atom you can see in the dead center of the cube, so plus one more. Let's ignore the fact that there are different colors for now, and we'll just assume that they're all the same atom. So a body-centered cubic unit cell actually has two atoms per unit cell. Now, this gets a little bit trickier. Where do the atoms touch? That's a little harder to see. It turns out that they touch along what would be referred to as the body-centered diagonal. So, for example, this top atom up here in the top left-hand corner touches 
the atom that's in the dead center of the cube, which touches the atom that is in the back bottom right of the cube. So it's through the three-dimensional diagonal that these atoms are actually in contact. And how long is that uh, distance there? Well, you've got one radius for that atom, two radii for that atom, and one radius for that atom. So that body diagonal has a length of 4r. And doing a little bit more elaborate geometric analysis, you would be able to eventually connect that radius to um, the volume of the cube. And you should see if you can work through that, um, that geometry analysis because it's a, it's a pretty handy thing to do. I'll just give you a hint. You've got to use the Pythagorean theorem a couple of times. All right, which now brings us to our last example of a cubic unit cell, face-centered cubic unit cell. Well, let me ask my first question. How many atoms are in the unit cell? Well, once again, I have eight corner atoms, each contributing one-eighth of themselves, plus now I have a new type of location. I have atoms that are located on the faces of, or the center of each face. That's what, in the space-filling model, that's what the red guys are doing. They are on the dead center of each face. Now, I have then, of course, I have six sides to the cube, so I have six facial atoms, and then they each contribute one half of themselves to the unit cell. So I then have a total of four atoms per unit cell in the face-centered cubic. Where do these atoms touch? Well, let me draw the front face of the cube on my space-filling model. Sorry, it's a little crooked. You can see they clearly don't touch along the edge, diet, along the edge, right? There's a gap there, so they're not touching there. But, and I'll draw this in black, they are touching along the face diagonal. And that face diagonal has a distance in terms of atomic radii of 4r. So again, you can see how we can start to quantify this guy and eventually go ahead and find the volume. All right, let me show you some other representations of unit cells so that you can begin to see um, maybe how these, um, how these guys are put together. All right, so here's our three different types of uh, cubic unit cells, and this picture kind of carves out the part of each atom that is actually contributing to the unit cell. So over here on the right we have our simple cubic and you can see how only one-eighth of each atom is actually inside the unit cell. On the far left we have our one-eighth times eight of our corner atoms plus the guy in the dead middle of the cube and then here for face centered we got our one-eighth of our corner atoms plus half of each atom that is on the face. So these sort of spliced away space filling models um, hopefully give you another way to see exactly how the unit cell is filled up with these different atoms. All right, let's take a look now at examples. Here is sodium chloride. All right, and on the left hand side I'm showing the sort of ball and stick diagram of sodium chloride and on the right hand side I'm showing you the space filling model. Now, the different locations are actually occupied by the different ions. If you look at green, which are the larger chloride ions, you can see that the chloride ions occupy the corners, and they occupy the face-centered positions. So if you were to count up the number of chloride ions that you see in my space-filling model, well, I've got the, let's go ahead and calculate this out, the eight corners, Right, each contributing an eighth of themselves for one, and then I would add to that, I've got my six facial uh, locations, each contributing one half of themselves, which is, of course, another three. So there are then four chloride ions in this unit cell. The sodium ions occupy a different position that we haven't really seen yet. They're occupying the edge centers, okay? They are along each edge of the cubic unit cell. Now, how much of those atoms are actually inside the unit cell? Okay, hopefully you can see that one quarter of the atom is actually inside that unit cell. Now, let's count up then, and I'll do this in red, how many sodium ions I have. I have a total of one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10, 11, 12. I have 12 edges occupied by the sodiums, each which contribute one-fourth of themselves. So there's three sodiums so far, plus there's a sodium, and you can only see this in the ball and stick diagram, there's a sodium in the dead center of the cube. So then it turns out that I have a total of four sodium ions in my unit cell. This makes sense, right? I have a 4 to 4 or 1 to 1 ratio of sodium to chloride in the unit cell. And we all know that the uh, formula unit of sodium chloride is NaCl, right? There's a 1 to 1 ratio there. So the numbers that go for the unit cell have to match what we know to be true in terms of its formula unit. All right, another uh, ball and stick and space filling model. This is cesium chloride. Convince yourself that we have a net total of one chloride atom or ion and one, chlor uh, one cesium ion in the unit cell for cesium chloride. And, of course, cesium chloride has a formula of CSCL. So take a look at this space filling model here and just make sure you can convince yourself that you see, indeed, one chloride and one cesium. All right? Is what we've done here with this approach to unit cells. And I want to look first at the bottom set of pictures here, what we're doing. So what we're doing is we're building lattices. So we start with the simplest level, and that would be the atom. Atoms then organize themselves in crystalline solids into unit cells. And we've been studying cubic unit cells of different flavors. These unit cells then are stacked upon one another to make a lattice and to make a lattice of even greater uh, dimensions. And eventually, the lattice gets so big that you and I could actually hold the material in our hand. And so what we did is we talked about how we count the atoms in the different unit cells. Here's the cesium chloride unit cell with its one-to-one -one ratio of cesium to chloride. Here's the sodium chloride unit cell also with its one-to-one -one ratio of sodium to chlorine, but it gets there in a different way than cesium chloride did. Here are some other materials that are cubic unit cells, and you might want to play around with, say, over here. How many yellow to purple atoms would you expect to see in that material? Can you come up with the yellow-purple formula by counting the atoms in the correct way? How about this guy, this gray-green unit cell? Can you come up with a formula for gray to green in that unit cell? And lastly, this purple-yellow unit cell, can you come up with the right number of purple to yellow atoms in that unit cell there? All right, so that's some quantifying we can do with unit cells. In the next video, we're going to take these cubic unit cell structures, and we're actually going to do a... Um, a stoichiometric calculation with them um, to show you how we can um, begin to even further quantify the properties of unit cells into the chemical concepts like stoichiometry, like Avogadro's number that we already know about. We'll do that in the next video.